just took a very early look at, you know, um, the first kind of early studies, twin studies of the, gene of the genetics of, um, uh, of IQ. And we showed that indeed, if you look at identical twins and non-identical twins, identical twins do correlate significantly more, almost twice as much as non-identical twins for IQ. And the correlation between, between MZ twins for IQ is really very high. And we said if you just take those early data of Perman and Hopman, um, the implication is that something like 74% of the variation in IQ um, would persist even if you held the environment constant, because it's due to genes. We said that, okay, the shared environment plays a bit of a role, about 10%, and the rest of it, the other 16%, is due to the slings and arrows, outrageous fortune, in short, individual environmental experiences and short-term chance events and so on. And we said, you know, that, of course, and we said that a couple of things about that. Um, we said that, on the whole, the data at least suggest that the um, unlike sex twins are no more different than like sex twins. MZ, DZs, and so that probably didn't, that suggests there wasn't a big effect just of straightforward gender, um, at least within families. And we also said that actually the correlation for twins is about the same size as um, DZ twins, is about the same size as that for siblings. So, in a sense, we've got some small test of the model, but in a sense, we haven't really explored its broader implications. Every model in science has to be put to the test. You know, does it apply to Everybody, or is there something really weird about these particular data? Um, but we, and I thought that just before we do that, I want to look at one more set of twin data, which kind of extend the model in a slightly broader sense by looking at not IQ, just IQ, but looking at other variables, which are sort of perhaps to some degree expressions of our cognitive functioning and how this goes on in society. And so I thought it'd be fun just to. Um, uh, since we shall have time to deal with chapter 7 in the book, um, but I think, um, I think you've done it, no, you may not even, I don't know, you, did they get, did they, 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 they don't get it, okay, well, but it'll, it'll, it'll sort of, you know, if you, if you can get all the book, it'll, you'll get, you can get this chapter. Um, this is a table which um, came from, uh, and didn't come from geneticists or psychologists, it came from econometricians. And in the late 70s, just really as the IQ thing was hitting the fan, um, these, um, Behrman, Taubman, T-A-U-B-M-A-N, and Wales, um, this actually is from earlier um, paper by Taubman in 1976, got the, um, got male twins, and quite a large sample, I think it's sort of, um, I think it's about, yeah, it's a thousand, just over a thousand pairs of MZs and 900 pairs of DZs. So that they understood the need for a bigger sample. Um, they were males, unfortunately, but there are reasons for that when you look at the variables. And what they did was to uh, obtain um, their amount of schooling, educational attainment, probably years of, you know, years of education. Um, they got their ratings of their initial occupation when they first entered the workforce. And then their later sort of, you know, adult mature occupation, as it were. I think they were, I think they were about 55 when they were studied. So they're all about the same age. They're all sort of, you know, middle aged. And they also got the amount of income reported on their tax returns. So you know, here we're not dealing about some abstract construct, you know, IQ, which sort of psychologists kind of invented. But we're actually dealing where the rubber hits the road. You know, this is how much you can screw out of Uncle Sam. These are American things. Okay. And, um, and what I just thought was interesting, um, for two reasons, this was really probably the first really thoughtful and large sample multivariate twin study. I mean, if, you know, for those of you who are kind of doing PhDs in this kind of stuff, you'll be, you know, you'll be sick of hearing about multivariate genetics and model fitting and MX and this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, it's definitely the thing that we all invented. Well, we didn't. These guys were really the first really good multivariate study. Actually, and came up with all the methods of analysis and thinking about the problem that we invented, like, sort of, you know, 10 years later. So, um, it's worth, it's just worth, you know, remembering that, you know, there's a very smart people out there. And these guys were not, they were econometricians. They really wanted to understand. It started because the, they'd heard the row about IQ. And there was a, an economist called Arthur Goldberger who was, you know, really being ugly about geneticists, believing that anything, could, anything important like IQ could be genetic. And these guys, and somebody said to, you know, well, hey, Paul Taubman, you know, what would all this mean if it's true? What would it mean for economics? And this was to go out and say, guys, we've got the data. So let's just look at the numbers. 
Um, the data look a bit more complicated, but what I want you to do, there's really two, there's two sets of rows. There's MZ twins, the top four rows, and DZ twins, the bottom four rows, right? And then the, um, then the, sort of the four left-hand columns are just the relationships between the variables if you ignore the twinning piece. The bit to focus on are the cross-sib correlation matrices. Um, these are the these are the correlations between the twin pairs. Okay, so if you look, for example, if you look at schooling, S, and look across to cross sib correlation matrices for the MZ twins, you have a correlation for MZs of 0.76. Actually, not unlike the correlation for IQ, really. Yeah, it's in the right ballpark. It's that ballpark, okay. And then if you go down to the 0.53. Ignore the 0.47, the 0.44, and the 0.48 for a moment. Well, for, for the, probably the rest of the class at this time. You've got there, that is the MZ correlation for initial occupation, 0.53. And the MZ correlation for, ad, for later occupation, sort of midlife occupation, 0.43. And for the amount of money you um, make in the year, 0.54. Okay, that's for MZs. Now, let's go down and look at the DZs. Okay, schooling, 0.54 DCs. What's the correlation for MCs? 0.76. Okay. Now these are quite. Now we're now talking about quite large samples here, right? Um, a rule of thumb: if you want to know what the standard error of a correlation coefficient is, right? Roughly, roughly. You take the square root of the sample size and take the reciprocal. So, you know, if you say, well, okay, there's 900 pairs, right? The square root of 900 is 30. 1 over 30 is, what, about 0 0.03, right? In round figures. No, just, I mean, develop a gut. You know, yes, you can get all this out of a computer, but develop a gut. It's not exact, but it gives you a good feel for you know, what's going on. And you start to make it a fool of yourself, and also you can have some fun with numbers. So, that 0.76 is probably 0.76 you know, plus or minus 0.03, right? The 0.54 is roughly, well, it is 0.54 plus roughly 0.03. So, what's going on there? What, what's this tell you about what the causes of similarity between relatives and individual differences for how much schooling you get? Don't be bashful. I'm not taking. I'm not assigning. You're not assigning grades, are you, Julian? No, no, no. Right. Genetics. Genetics. Right. Okay. Genes are playing a new role. Okay. Now, thinking from what we did last time. How big is the genetic? What is the estimate of the contribution of genetic factors if we assume that the model we're using here is a similar one to IQ? How would I get the estimate of the genetic contribution from those two numbers? Again, you know, either shout out what you think not the answer is or tell me how you do it. Yeah, go for it, please. Now, where did you get the 76% from? Um, oh, I'm sorry, I was looking at No, that. okay, you're, you're in the right ballpark. You look at the numbers, that's a start, right? But that, that's not how you, that's not quite how we do it if you've got DZs as well, right? It's a formula that we used yesterday. Yeah, okay. It's right. Subtract. Somebody over there on the back row, I thought they'd call a hand. Did I see a hand raised on the blue, with the blue shirt there? <laughs> Ooh, we, <read> what? <laughs> <laughs> do you want to give it a shot? Um. How do I get it? 0 0.44. Tell me how you did that. Um, 0.76 is VG plus common environment. Right. VCE. Yeah. And the DZ uh, is 0.54, which is half VGE right. plus half VCE. Right. Go for it. Plus yeah. VCE. So yeah. you cancel out the common environment. So you subtract yeah. 0.54 minus 0.76. Which well, that's it. 0.76 minus 0.54. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's okay. You're fine. Yeah. So that would be half VG. Right. So multiply times yeah. two. Yeah, great. You take the DZ, dip, take the DZ correlation from the MZ correlation and double the difference. And that's your first guess 
of the importance of genetic factors. So roughly, you know, even for something like schooling, from these data, 0.44, of the differences you see are a reflection of the genetic differences with which these kids were endowed, at, well, these people were endowed at their birth. Yeah, okay, well now, if that's the case, then um, how... You said 0.44, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay, 0.44, yeah, okay. 0.44, so, uh, if 0.44 is the contribution of genetic effects, what about the shared environment? 0.76 Which is 0.32? Yeah. So 30, rather more, 32% of the variation in this, you know, characteristic seems to be due to shared environment. Okay, well, if we got 44% and what you say it was 32%, what's left? The unique environment. Yeah, the, all the other environmental things that twins don't share. Yeah. So you've got 34%. So you almost got a pretty much an even, an even breakdown um, of, the, of the roles of genes in the shared environment. Okay, well, let's just do one more for fun, just to get the idea. Okay, now let's do the same thing for income. MZ correlation 0.54, DZ correlation 0.30. What is the contribution of the unshared, random slings and arrows of environmental fortune contribution? Arithmetic. Take the difference between, uh, just, okay, I mean, you've got, 54% is the correlation for MZ twins, and that's all the stuff that MZ twins share. What's left? Unique environment. Yeah. Okay. So, go on. 0.46. 0.46. Right. 1 minus 0.54. So, in this case now, 46, you know, by the time these guys have got to middle life, okay, the astonishing thing is that they still correlate 0.56, but the, re the rest of it, the 0.44, is all the things that have happened to them since birth as individuals their own unique environmental experiences, the chances of life, you know, all the things that perhaps happened to them in their teens and in their, you know, I mean, things you have no control over, really. Okay, how big is the genetic effect? If you don't know the answer, how do you get it? Come on, come on. So you're going to take point five. You take point five four, subtract point three. That gives you point two four, right? Multiply by two. Yeah, you got it. I mean, it's it's, it's, it's almost mindless actually, isn't it? Really, it's it's fun. Point four eight. So nearly fifty percent, even at the age of fifty five. You know. You, you, you have been on this planet for 55 years, and nearly 50% of the differences in income are a reflection of, 50% of the variation in income, is a, ref, is a reflection of just the stuff you were born with. It's pretty amazing, isn't it, really? Now, I have to say, by the way, these, these, these contributions are much bigger than the contributions for the five things like depression and personality and stuff. Um, schizophrenia is less so. I mean, the, the schizophrenia is massively genetic. You know, and I mean, you, you could do the same sums here for schizophrenia if you wanted. Okay, well, I just put, and you can do the rest of yourself. Um, actually, of course, what's really cool about this is because you've got the four variables, you can also look at, you know, the genetic relationship between how much you earn and how much schooling you have. You know, is it the same genes? Well, the answer is, yeah, quite largely actually. They're, Either you can, if you read the chapter, you get a lovely description of this printed up by David, but we need to talk more about IQ. Okay, so that's just to you know, get you thinking, you get the juices flowing a bit, and, um, and, and make you realise that actually cognitive functioning is probably pervasive, and 
it, it impacts on a whole range of our sort of aspects of our life, and the genes seem to be as my old mentor John Jinks would say. He said, "Ah, oh, Lyndon," he said, "genes will out, genes will out." <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the IQ model. So we came away with a model which said roughly 74% of the IQ differences, uh, the the, uh, the variation IQ, is probably due to genetic factors. And now the question is, okay, that's great, this is just twins, you know, how do we know that's really what's going on? So let's begin to predict, you know, so this is like sort of Einstein predicting the departures of the orbit of Mercury or something like that as he goes around the sun, you know, except we're not Einstein. Okay, so, well, the first thing we've done, because all our twins were twins reared together, weren't they? Right? And we said, well, okay, you know, 10% of the variation seems to be due to um, factors that um, twins shared, which were not genetic. It's not a very big effect, right? The bulk of, bulk of twin resemblance is genetic. Now, if that's the case, if I were to take identical twins and separate them at birth into different randomly chosen parts, what would you expect the correlation to do? Yes, sir. Decrease. Decrease. How much do you think? Much? Because they're not sure to share them by name. Okay. But supposing a big chunk of. If they, yes, if they go down a bit, it would go down some, wouldn't it? And you're right. The correlation would drop by an amount which is due to the effects of the shared environment, because they no longer share the shared environment that they would have shared if they'd been living together, right, it would drop, okay, now, suppose we now do it for IQ, and we're already on the basis of our other previous studies of twins reared together, we said, well, if you believe the twin data, 74% of the variation is due to genetic effects. If I take MZ twins and I separate them, Is their correlation going to drop by much? Well, let's suppose, okay, suppose, the shared, suppose the shared environment explains 10% of the variance. Okay. Monozygotic twins together share that effect. So that makes the MZ twins correlated, or whatever amount they are. Now, what's going to happen to that correlation if I were to take those twins, MZ twins, and put them in randomly separated, separate them into random parts. So they no longer share that point one. So your prediction is, right, in, you know, if you had a large enough sample and all the rest of it, that if I'm right that 10% of the variation is due to the shared environment, when I separate those twins into random homes, the correlation is a drop by about point one. Well, at the time of writing, there were four studies of separated twins in the literature. Actually, since then, um, there has been a very well done fifth study, by, um, engineered by Tom Bouchard, who I think is now emeritus professor at um, the University of Minnesota, it was the Minnesota Twin Study. Um, where they actually also obtained separated twins that have been separated since birth and done a very extensive battery of tests, not just cognitive tests, but also personalities, social attitudes, they did immunological tests and they may even have done brain scans on some of these people and that kind of stuff, you know, EKGs and things. So, there we have four studies of twins and actually um, using two kinds of IQ tests. Um, the first are group tests. Group tests are basically where, you know, you all sit in a room and you hand out a paper and you sort of check the boxes for the students, right? So it's done as a group and that, yeah. Individual tests are the ones where you sit down with a psychologist and the psychologist will give you sort of like maybe beads of thread on a string, you know, copy my design or, um, you know, please can you define the word, you know, what does the word um, chiroscuro mean or something like that, you know. And things like that. So there are four studies. Um, 
Newman, the, the first leaf, 1937, and that's Newman et al. Newman, Freeman, and Holzinger. The first study of separated twins in the literature. What table number is that? Oh, sorry, this is total number. Thank you, Judy, very much. Yes. Table 5.3. Yeah, now we're back, back to chapter 5. Table 5.3. Page 110. I've got a paper in my copy, but yeah. It's in the text 110 of the book, but it's by just mm -hmm. the 5.3 in the, in, the, in, the, in the sheets you've got. Okay. Oh, you're looking at some of you have got the. Some of you looking at the. Go? We'll go? Yeah, okay. Uh, so, four studies Newman, Freeman, Holzinger, 1937. Classic, classic study, really. You know, I mean, set the time. Um, Jerry Shields, Jerry Shields, 1962, worked at the Institute of Psychiatry. Um, Jerry Shields was a phenomenal guy. He was actually, um, I think he had, um, I think it was muscular dystrophy. Jerry Shields used to drive a ride around in a wheelchair. And an astonishing character, and a, and a very much loved and respected scholar of his, of, of his day. He's now sadly died. Yeah, Jerry Shields, Jerry Shields, oh God, I remember, Jerry Shields used to drive a Mini. And he used to strap his wheelchair on the back, of you know, the Mini, the Mini, the sort of, now smaller Mini. Well, I mean, the real Mini, the English Mini is much smaller than the American Mini. You know, I mean, it was, sort of, it was about the size of this table. You know, this table. <laughs> he'd, he'd strap it, he had a yellow mini, he'd strap the wheelchair on the back, and he'd sit at the front, he'd drive down Denmark Hill like a man sitting there doing this all the way, you know, God, you know, to make it to the bottom of the hill. But a, a phenomenal character, much loved, and a, great, and a great influence on the field, particularly in psychiatric genes. He and um, a guy called Irving Gottesman, who is actually still out at UVA, I think he's, no, actually he's retired now from back to Minnesota again. Um, and um, did some, some very seminal early work on genetics of personality, for example. 38 pairs, and the nice thing, Shields produced, produced, wrote a book on these pairs of twins called Monozonic Twins Reared Together and Apart. And the beautiful thing about this is that at the very back of the book, there's a great appendix where it actually gives the most wonderful sort of clinical descriptions of each of these twin pairs, you know, describes their environment, describes where they, they grew up and all that kind of stuff. And, so you get a really good feel for the sort of for the care and quality of the data. Um, I mean, there are some real horror stories. I mean, it turns out that one of the one of the pairs of twins was separated because the father sold one of them off. I mean, no, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Duh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Jules Nielsen is a very small Danish study. Cyril Burt. Now, anybody, anybody heard of Cyril Burt? 1966. Cyril Burt was a very eminent British psychologist and editor of a journal. Um, he was also the um, so advisor to the City of London Education Authority. And it was Cyril Burt who um, really set the tone for probably the next 50 years of English education by deciding that at the age of 11, every kid should sit a test, including an IQ test, and on the basis of that, they would be assigned to their next sort of their high school. And so, you know, if you were a smart kid, you know, and um, I got lucky, you know, and you went to a really good school where, you know, you had the school crest on all the books and you got to write real pens and that kind of stuff and had to be you know, the brightest and best of the teachers. And if you didn't, you know, oh, that's tough, mate, you know, so I mean, there's an illustration. And of course, partly because he was looking for, you know, genetic gifts. And of course it wasn't, you know, in that sense, it was, you know, he was really sort of, I mean, I could never have afforded to go to university if it had not been for, you know, because I mean, I'm an ordinary kid from a relatively sort of lower middle class kind of background, you know. And so I was a beneficiary of that system. You know, it was, it was supposed to kind of sort of focus on the innate gifts of the kid rather than whether a parents could afford to sort of send them to a good school. Which I hope is the worst. Anyway, yeah. but um, he was... Um, regarded with as a sort of, you know, as something of a pariah in England um, by, you know, sort of by, well, actually, believe not liberals like me, you know, because he was, um, um, he, he was rather, you know, I think Bill thought it was a very oppressive view of, you know, of, of the human condition. But he did publish <coughs> correlations on 53 twin pairs of separated monozygote twins. Now, Burt became the focus of controversy. Because um, there were certain kind of weird, you know, I'm not going to flog this to death, but there were some weird things about the data. Like it's actually very hard to get hold of it. Um, the two women who worked with him, um, one was a Margaret Howard, 
Um, I don't think it had great difficulty ever tracking her down. The lady who actually supposed to have done the testing could never be found. <laughs> so, you know, there were sort of, um, there, there was a lot of, in, 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 when the, in, in the mid-70s, when everybody was trying to discredit the whole idea of genetics by Q, BERT data became the sort of the, the target of, of some of program. Um, and in fact, so did Jerry Shields. That was why Jerry Shields actually had the numbers. Actually, I did at once, um, I did get, I did end up, we managed at one point to get a hold of Cyril Burt's numbers. Um, but the thing about it was they were too good to be true. The mean for the first and second twins were all so close to the, I mean, it's like Mendel's, Mendel's results, you know. The, whereas Mendel, you know, Mendel's ratios are too close to be true, really, you know, because of chance, you know. I mean, they were sort of, uh, too good. Um, so it's a bit true. Some things about Burt's data too were just a little bit too good to be true. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, point seven seven. Look at those. I mean, um, what do you get for okay MZ twins in um, uh, MZ twins in table five point two? Point eight four, right? Twins reared together. Point eight four. Twins reared apart. Point seven three. Point seven seven. Point seven seven. Point seven seven. Does the model fit? Pretty damn good, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the right, okay, it's not 0 0.1 exactly, but it won't be 0 0.1 exactly. It'll be close enough given the sampling errors, the correlation. Well, you know, a correlation of 38 pairs, 0.77 plus or minus what? 38, say so let's call it 36. Square root of 36 is 6, 1 over 6 is point, almost, yeah, about point 0.18 or something, isn't it? Yeah, point 0.15. So that point 0.77 is actually point 0.77 plus or minus, you know, it's, it's definitely in the right ballpark. Okay. So apparently the model fits so far, you know. It survived its first test. Well now, if um, if the model fits, what other things might we do? Well, let's start looking at siblings. Siblings reared apart. If siblings reared apart, it was if diagonal twins, like six diagonal twins, correlate 0.47. Okay, based on the 730 pairs, um, sorry, not 730, based on, based on the um, Herman and Hogman study, not, not 730 pairs, but 4.47 based on, not many pairs actually, based on 96 pairs, yeah. Okay, so, if the model is right, if the model based on twins is right, what kind of prediction would you make and why for the correlation between siblings who have been separated at birth. Well, walk me through it. How much shared, in, uh, you know, where does the shared environment go if siblings have been separated at birth? There should be no shared environment. There'll be no shared environment because of the similarity, right, no, exactly right, yeah. So, there's no CE. Right? Let's actually do one way, but what? Let me sort of write the model up because it makes it pretty easy. Okay, so you've got. Um, okay. MZs, monozygotics together, let's say VG and VCE, and MZ twins really together have one VG and one CE. Um, Diazygotic twins really together, we said, have a half VG and VC. Monozygotic twins reared apart have one VG and no VC, and let's say full siblings reared apart, FSA, have half VG, oh, read away, oh, no VC, and how much VG? If the model's right. Okay? Half, oh, right? Now, what's our estimate of VG roughly point, what's that, point seven four, something like that, roughly? Yeah? What's the estimate of VC? E? Yeah, okay, so what would we. Well, here we've got not, the correlation of R is 0. Point, what did we say that was? 84. 
take whatever, you know, solving errors, okay? Well, well, let's look at the numbers. Three studies, and it's doing the right sort of thing, but it's not actually, you know, this is more like, what, 0.3-ish? Probably an average 0.35, I don't know. What do you mean? I mean, it's, it seems to be sort of tied up reasonably well, but it's not perfect. But it won't be perfect because the division is different. Population, you know, the answer you get to any of these things depends on how you measure the trait to some degree, and of course where you get your sample from. I mean, if I do it in Iran and do it in Australia, I'm looking at different gene pools, different you know cultural context, different ranges of environment, different educational systems, that kind of stuff. So you know you can't guarantee you're going to get the same answer um, with different exactly data from different studies. Okay. Well, now. That's kind of taking the genetic similarities and separating the environments. That's one way to do it. But you know, now you begin to think, oh gosh, well, I've got a lot of things I can do with this now, right? So, what would happen, do you think, if I were to take unrelated individuals and rear them in the same home from birth? No genetic. No genetic similarity, right? So any correlation you see is going to be due to the fact that they've been reared in the same homes. Yeah, okay, well, yeah, the adoption study. Of course. Oh, duh. Yeah, right. Now, think about it for a minute, of course. Um, you have to sort of um, file at least by title the fact that when you do an adoption study, on the whole, you know, people adopt from agencies. I mean, I know I've got a ground. Friend that actually works works on twins in um, you know, another uh, university who went through the process of adoption and you know was very rigorous. I don't know. I just arrived. Oh, you know, who can you trust to write a recommendation? <laughs> Get your local vicar, right? You know, I, had to, I had to write a letter of sort of you know of kind of support. You know, they'll be great parents. You know, kind of. It's all true. They are great parents. But you know, nevertheless, you know, a lot of care is taken over the adoption process. It's not a random process. The environments tend probably to be rather better than average. And, you know, indeed, sometimes what they try to do also is to sort of match the homes to which the children go to some degree with the socioeconomic sort of backgrounds of the homes in which they came. You know, so there's a whole bunch of things that might go wrong with adoption studies in terms of, I don't mean wrong socially, but wrong in terms of science. You know, it's the problem with working with people. You know, you can't randomise your rats over the environment. Um, but nevertheless, lots of people have done it. And not, and, um, including Cyril Burt, if you believe him. Yeah? I have a, I have a chap a letter from Cyril. I took that in there. Um, anyway, table 5.5, IQ correlation between all these things really apart. We're really in the same home. Based on what we already think we know, what would you expect the correlation between unrelated individuals really in the same home to be? If it's shared environment, point have point one. Yeah, give or take. Yeah. What are we getting? Well, okay, point three four, point two five, minus point oh three, point three three, point two three, point oh five, point five. Scored out in skills. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you know, it's a bit of a mess, ain't it? Really. I mean, uh, you know, um, well, actually, this is the Cyril Burke, for example, point two five. Now, Cyril Burt, therefore, was already, already, looking at, um, already looking at a whole range of correlations. And, he, you know, and the one that stuck out like a sore thumb is not fitting really quite that well with the model, with the unrelated rear together, 0.25. So, well, I, you know, I was thinking probably 0.1-ish. 
And I got this letter from him because I've written a paper in which he published in his journal, this theoretical paper. And um, he said, Dear Dr. Riz, well, I wasn't actually Dr. Riz, that's why I was still a graduate student, but so I was very flattered. But he said, Look, he said, I wonder if you can help me. He said, Because you're obviously a geneticist and you understand these kind of things, which are really true. Um, he said, um, You know, I've got this study, as you know, and everything really looks really good, except that the correlation for the separated, for the unrelated three together, is a bit too high, you know. I'm sure he said that's due to placement effects, but can you please explain to me how I might model it? Well, I was too young and too stupid to know. I could probably do it now with a bit of help. David could have done it, you know, he's smarter than I am. But, um, and so, but what's interesting, of course, this is the guy who is supposed to have cheated. My, my, was my, my little piece of the history of science is if Bert had cheated, how come he was writing to me, trying to ex ask me to how, how he could explain an anomaly in his data? That's just a little bit of historical insight. Anyway, so, you know, some of them are in the right ballpark, some are a bit on the big side, but then we do have to deal with placement issues. Now, <coughs> since then, <coughs> two things have happened. <coughs> Robert Plowman, who is still, um, he's probably about, I think about my age actually now, but he's still um, gung-ho in London. He's an American um, psychologist who was in Bold at the same time as David, uh, who moved to London. Um, Robert Plowman actually, and John DeFries and with David Fulker, all did the Colorado Adoption Project, which will come across us in sort of, you know, starting in about sort of the 70s and you know, well, in the early 80s. And they did this really, really, really carefully, and indeed they did, were able to estimate the effects of placement and correct for it in their analyses and sort of, you know, and take, in, take into account the fact that correlations between the socioeconomic status of the other Actually, the effect wasn't very big, to be honest. No. I mean, they, the conclusion was that the correlation you know, the, the shared environment probably was, you know, about what place everybody said it was. Yeah. Okay, so now we then really get to the so far we've talked about collateral relatives. And they all been twins and siblings and foster siblings. So we looked at sort of pairs like now. Of course, you know, where do you think a lot of the shared environment comes from if it is there? Who gives the kids their shared environment? Would you, if I were just say, well, you know, let's, let's all play sociology for a minute, okay? Hmm. Yeah. Let's pretend to be psychologists. You know, where does the shared environment come from? Parents. Parents! Right! You know, where do you spend all your time? I mean, you know, living with your mum and dad or whoever, you know, hanging out in the neighbourhood, okay? I mean, who determines which neighbourhood you end up in? You know, who determines which school you go to? It's all about where your parents end up. So, <coughs> clearly, if this is the case, then to some extent the people who give you your genes also actually give you your environment. And so if the shared environment is important, of course, this means that you know, if you just look at natural parents and children and measure their IQ or measure anything about natural parents and natural children, you know, they're their children, any correlation you see there is also going to be a function of genes and shared environment, just off, off the shelf, you know, and then you have to ask what is it really, you know, what really is going on. So let's think for a minute about parents and offspring. Yeah. Oh, let's do unrelated to together, let's put unrelated to together in the model here. UT, unrelated together, zero genes, one shared environment. And 0.25 maybe. We're actually finding, not predicting, but finding. Now, what about parents? Let's think about parents and offspring reared together. Now, we're going to think in a very simple-minded way here, okay? Um, so, we're going to assume for the sake of argument that the same shared environmental impacts on the kids are the ones with the they also share with their parents. So, we're going to say, well, for the sake of argument, Parents and children who, are real, who live together share one CE. Now, in truth, of course, there's a whole lot, the environment's a lot more complicated than that. You know, parents might only provide part of the environment. The actual answer you get depends on how you actually think of modeling the environment. There's a first shot, let's just sort of not, you know, I mean, this is really saying, look, you know, you've got a family, and the divine randomizer in the sky and the shuttle of whatever the divine shuttle, the shuttle, the shuttle contains and sort of does that. 
and he falls on the family, and plop, you've got it, right? You know, if you have to dig into a bucket of gold that day, the whole family gets the bucket of gold. That's the model. It's the cow cat model. I mean, English cow cat is you know, what you cow cat's what you find a in a field. And if you step in, you walk across a field. It's, it's a random blob of stuff that impacts on the whole family. That would make it look like that. Because you know, the whole family gets the same cow pan, right? Or the same bucket of gold. Now, okay, genes. Parents and children. What do you think the genetic similarity of a, of a, of a, of a, a parent and a child, and their, you know, of, 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 say, mothers and children is? How much are their genes? What, what, what I put in there for V, G? Half. Yeah, half. Right. Half or half. Depending where you come from. Right? <laughs> half, half. Right. Now, I put a half in there, and that is making some strong assumptions about what the genes do and how the population is structured. It is assuming, one, that all the effects of the genes, all the little effects of the copy, you know, 500,000 genes that could the differences in IQ all simply add up to produce the phenotype. If they interact, or if there's dominance, then that correlation, that half, will not apply. Furthermore, if there is assortative mating, the genetic similarity between parents and children will be bigger than a half by an amount that depends on the strength of assortative mating. So, you know, we're assuming a very simple universe here. Okay. And of course, that's also true for siblings, too. The same basic assumptions are made here <coughs> and here. Additive genetic effects and random mating. Now, we'll see in a minute, it's no surprise, and doesn't require IQ of children to point out that, um, you know, actually spouses do not choose themselves at random with respect to IQ. The correlation between spouses for IQ, sort of point three ish. Point three ish. You know, it's, it's not trivial. It's enough to have a genetic effect. And the social effects, you know, I mean, if spouses, the spouses that come together, when you choose your mates, you are choosing the packet of genes and the environmental influence to which you are committing your packet of genes and environmental influences. Yeah. Terrifying thought, isn't it, really? Yeah. You know, for a lot, it's more important, the correlation with IQ is more important than physical traits. Interestingly enough, it's not as important as the correlation for... Um, social traits, like educational status, we're on. the college for educational status is much higher between spouses. It's more like 0 0.5, 0 0.6. The current, of course, you know, what do you mean? What's college about? College is not about getting an education, it's about choosing a mate, right? <laughs> um, the correlation for social attitudes, for conservative, I think we, you know, it's about, you know, 0.5. It's really big, you know, it's, it's, uh, so IQ is that kind of middle range. Personality is like zero. Yeah. Nobody cares. It's you might think so. No, you don't really. Okay, so that's that's so that's biological parents raising their biological kids. Okay, now supposing we take parents and adopted children. So that's parents. So that's now a a foster parent and foster child living together. How much VG are they going to share? Zero. Zero. Right, good. Assuming what? Random. Random. Yeah, assuming that there is no... I mean, obviously if you start matching parents and, you know, matching foster parents with their... But, uh, you're probably, if you match on phenotype, you're matching partly on genotype. Same for children and mate. You know, if you match spouses on phenotype, you're matching on for a genotype. So, yeah, 
in the assumption of no placement effects, that's zero. Under the great randomizer in the sky dispensing either gold or cow cap. What's that going to be? One. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's one way of skin. Now, let's look at the other things now. Okay. Now, let's take, supposing in doing the adoption study, I could measure the biological parents before their child was adopted. As it were. Well, at least I can measure them. You know, so I, I find I find kids and I track down their natural parents and I measure them. Okay, so this would be parents and offspring reared apart. What coefficients do I put in there? Back row, you've been quiet for a bit. A half, half of what? Half VG, right? Yeah. Again, assuming that placement is random and everything else is fair and above board, what about the shared environment? Zero. Zero. Right. Absolutely. Good. So you're getting the idea, you see, because the thing about it, this is and. This is an, an, crassly simple model. And in the end of the day, it may prove to be wrong and a whole lot more interesting and a whole lot probably more things going on. But the idea is that you're building up a series of observations, data points, and you're asking what do we expect the pattern of those data points to look like if we for, come up with an idea of how the world is. Now, already you look, okay, so how many Correlations that I've got. If I do this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight sort of possible data points. Okay. Eight observations that I expect to have a different pattern as a function of how the world is. How many basic principles have I included in my model so far? I've got eight correlations, but how many things am I thinking is really important? Things, I'll put things in quotes. Principles, um, aspects of nature. What, how many, you know, what am I trying to get out of it? What am I trying to estimate? Two. Two, right, yeah, so I've got, I've got eight <coughs> things that I can measure, all of which are expected to reflect different doses of only two parameters, two principles, genes and environment. Now, of course, in the good old days, the simple days, you'd just say, well, okay, I can get them, I can take any two of those, I've got a pair of simultaneous equations there, I can get, as we did, VG and VE, right? Or I can do, well, okay, I've got um, that one and that one. Why don't I do that? A, and with those eight correlations, I've got a, a large number of possible ways I'm going to get the numbers, right? And each of them would get slightly different answers, probably. So which is right? Well, the answer is actually none of them, right? Absolutely right. What you want is an approach which says, okay, I'm going to take all of those data together, all those eight correlations. And I'm going to come up with a method, which we'll see in a minute, that actually estimates the things I'm interested in using the best possible approach, and best means using all the data, taking allowance of the effects of chance, and getting the two numbers that best summarize the data. And you kind of juggle, you know, I mean, I can say, well, okay, I'm going to start off with 0.5 for VG and 0.4 for VC, and you know, I can see how well it fits, I'll it'll be terrible, right? And I'll keep fiddling those numbers until I get the pair of numbers which gives me the best correspondence I can possibly achieve between the data I see and what the model can do. Now if that corresponds when I've got it is very good. I say, okay, you know, 
there is, a, there is a version of the world which fits these data very well and very simple. But of course it may not. No matter how much I fiddle these numbers, given these coefficients, the fit might be terrible. Now if the fit is terrible, if, the, if what I see doesn't match my best possible predictions under the model, what do I say about the model? It sucks! Start again, Dr. Reeves. Right? You know, so we have a, a tremendous opportunity here. The more numbers you can get, and the simpler you can make the model, in a way, if the model fits, you think, gosh, this is fantastic. I've explained all these complicated data in terms of two very simple principles, or one even, maybe. You know. If the model fails, oh, it's bad luck. Let's go back and do it all again. And that's the whole, I mean, that's really what science is about. You know, it's building a model, testing it against the data, and if the model don't work, can the model and start again, or refine the model, add more stuff. But you only add more stuff when you're forced to do it by the data. Okay, let's look at more data then. Let's look at the data bit. Now, so, we do have here, table 5.6, correlations between fathers, foster fathers, and their adopted children, and foster mothers and their adopted children. A lot of them. People don't want to buy a book. You know, I mean, Sandra Scar, I think, actually, Sandra Scar was chair of psychology at UVA and then um, for some reason left and I think now is. Oh, actually, she became, um, she became director of you know, the CEO of some, um, one of these sort of childcare kind of, um, you know, where you dump your kids in the morning, where you pick up, you know, you know when, if you've got to go to work, sort of thing. Um, and then I think she retired. I think she actually retired to Hawaii. You know, she had a vision of Sandra Scar. She's a very tall, statuesque blonde from you know, um, probably about my age. Um, she was blonde last time I saw her, uh, and, and sort of retired. I think retired to the beach on Hawaii. So there's a you know, quite a history there, I suspect. But look at the correlations. <laughs> so you may laugh. Thank you. Yeah, it always makes me better. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, Sandra Scar. You know, I always there's this thing about you know, do you kiss women colleagues when you meet them? You know, I mean, it's always very weird that men meet, when men colleagues meet, they don't kiss, right? But sort of, you know, when you meet your woman colleague, you know, if you haven't seen for a long time, you know, there's still this thing about kissing and stuff. And I always, always think it's seemed rather, I always felt a bit awkward about being kissed by Sandra Scar. You know, I thought, well, you know, this woman's chair of psychology at UVA. We do not have a relationship other than professional, you know. I mean, if, the, if Sandra were sort of, you know, Bernie Scar, um, it wouldn't be natural something to do, you know, it's, it's weird. So I was just think of, uh, it's odd stuff. Yeah, but anyway, look at this, let's do the numbers. <laughs> Enough of that, let's do the numbers. <laughs> um, what do you see? Are they zero? Hmm? No, they're not zero, are they? No, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of a correlation there, right? Yeah. yeah it's like sort of, you know, Point two ish, right? You know. um, what would you think if the correlations between mothers and their foster children were bigger than the correlations between fathers and their foster children? Children spend more time with their mother. Right, yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, you know, I mean, there's not, there's not a whole lot of that evidence for that here, but, you know, you begin to see how as you build up a picture of the data, you begin to think of all the other things that might be going on. You say, well, maybe, well, no, it's not. Actually, if you look at mother-child, look at natural parents and natural children, the parent offspring correlation is about the same for males and females. You know, I mean, all these great myths about, oh, mothers are so important. You know, poor old dad, we do is go out to work, you know, and then go on. The bottom line is, at the end of the day, you know, Mendel was right. Parents, you know, mothers and fathers, males and contribute equally to, to sort of to the genetic construct of the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe a bit of shared environment here. It could be a bit of placement, but you know, it's not really that zero. <coughs> <coughs> oh dear, I've lost the heading to. Um... <coughs> oh, anybody got? Oh, look at the book. Okay. The next table, because I'll figure out what I'm looking at and see what those are, actually. Sorry about that, guys. Give me a minute. Um, chapter 5. Let's go to chapter 5. Let's see. 
So I'm going to fill the headings on the table. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, now, um, table 5.7, I'll lift the heading off. Sorry about that. Um, that is, those are the IQ correlations between mother and child reared apart. Okay? So, under the model, what are these? What are they measures of? Mother, child, reared, with the child reared apart from the mother. On the assumption of mother placement and all the rest of it, and a bunch of other stuff, and the separation occurred at birth, and so on and so forth, right. Um, small studies, hard to get the data. Well, that's, you know, um, 0.4 Skolak scales, Horn 75, Snig 938, the largest sample, 0.13. Um, yeah, well, you know, you can't really tell, sometimes they're not really big yet, you've got three estimates, you could pull them, you know, and see which is the best, if you pull them roughly, you would probably get somewhere around about 0.25, wouldn't you, probably, a bit on the small side. Now, think for a minute, think for a minute. When you look at the parent-offspring correlation, we are talking about just additive genetic effects. The model we're using says when you look at the sibling correlation, you're looking at just additive effects. Now the truth is that's not quite true. The parent offspring correlation, in the absence of epistasis, gene interaction, is always just an additive contribution. The sibling correlation, even in the absence of epistasis, is the additive contribution plus anything due to dominance. So there are even genetic reasons why the sibling correlation might be a bit too big. So maybe you know the genetic correlation was a bit more complicated than we actually sort of you know, give it credit for. That's one possibility. Now, of course, something else is going on here. When you measure parents, how old are they? Probably. No, well, they're yeah, not. So probably, no, most of them probably 30, uh, in their 30s at least, right? When you measure children, how old are the children? Probably 20 years younger? No. What is different? I mean, you know, think about age for a minute, okay? So, you've got a bunch of parents who are, say, you know, in, let's just say 30s and 40s, right? And even assuming the kids were measured in their sort of, you know, teens, they might be sort of like, you know, 13 through, I don't know, 20 or something like that. What's happened to the parents that is still to happen to the kids? or hasn't happened to the kids. Well, the pens have gotten older for a start, right. Yeah. Okay. Now, you know, think about all the stuff that is going on as people age. You know, I mean, I joke, you know, because age, I don't know, more, like bits of stuff and drop off, you know? Now, why, you know, my blood pressure starts to go up, my brain starts to rot, I can't, I mean, you know, I can think, oh God, I've got, I call it geriatric anomia, I can't, you know, I'm teaching, I can't remember the names of sort of either students or great scholars and that kind of stuff, going on the papers, all right, you know, it's terrible, you know. Um, what causes aging changes? Why do things, you know, I mean, what sort of things are going on between, you know, 20 and 71? 
obviously, there's an awful lot of environment that I've had that you haven't yet. I mean, you know, I actually came to America when Ronald Reagan was sort of just being elected, you know. Um, you guys well, they weren't even here yet, probably, close, right? I mean, <coughs> I remember one of my, you know, teaching with teaching our behavior students, I sort of used the example of the shuttle disaster as what happens if you have a lousy model. You know, and I showed the movie of the Challenger going up and blowing up, and I suddenly realized one day that these guys actually, I remember that happening. You guys only can read about it. You know, there's a whole series of things that have happened to me that have not happened to you. I mean, socially, culturally. Now, you know, one of the major assumptions of all this genetic stuff that we talk about here is that there is no genotype environment interaction. That the genes that are expressed are assumed to be independent of and not affected by the environment in which the person develops. You've grown up with totally different challenges from me. Not grew up in England for God's sake. You know, we had a Labour government for a long time. You guys don't even know what socialism is yet. You know, we, we could tell. We might find out later on today, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's different. The environments that you live up live in may affect which genes are expressed, and vice versa, you know. Yeah, I mean, the genes may, different, different individuals may react differently to the environment as a function of their genotype. You don't talk any of that, But if parents and children are expressing different genes by virtue of the environments, then the correlation will drop. Important assumption of all this kind of stuff. Now, of course, that's the external universe. The facts of the case are is, you know, me getting old, how I get old, is a function partly of my genotype. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of genes that are switched on in me now, as it were, that aren't yet switched on in you guys. You know, and the genes of cognitive decline, you know, the, the genes that control getting fat, all that kind of stuff, you know. You've got a lot of treats to come yet, you know. The point again, if any, so insofar as the genes that are expressed in the adults are not the same as the genes expressed in the kids, by virtue of development, aging, you're going to get, you know, some weird relationships. Probably one of the most interesting figures in the, the, the second most interesting figure in the chapter is figure 5.2. And unfortunately, David doesn't label it, which doesn't, doesn't help a whole lot. He describes it, but doesn't the labels in labeling is inadequate. What we have here is data from Ehrman and Parsons, um, Lee Ehrman and, um, there you go, my geriatric anomia. Parsons, Parsons, what's his first name? Oh, God, that's terrible. I can't remember. Yeah, there you go. Genes are switching off, right? Okay, but what he's done here is to plot the correlations between parents and children as a function of age. Right? The age of the child. And um, honestly, I'm not sure. He says it's mothers and fathers. I'm not sure which is mothers and which is fathers on this, but it doesn't really matter too much. So what you've got, the bottom curves... The sort of the dotted curves are the correlations between foster parent and foster child as a function of the age of the kid, <coughs> and the other two curves are the one for mothers and one for fathers. I think I think the left hand is probably mothers and the right hand fathers, just for the sake of argument. Okay, and the other two curves are what is the current one is the correlation as a function of the age of the child between natural parent and natural child reared in the same home and the other one is the correlation between natural parent and natural child reared in different homes. Now just look at the numbers and think about them for a minute. Look at the graphs. Okay, so let's look at the 
Let's just look at the bottom graph, the bottom lines, the dotted lines, you know. How, firstly, how big is the correlation between the foster parent and the foster child? Roughly, in this study. Any old number that seems to look like about right. I mean, roughly. You like to do the mental arithmetic. Look at the numbers. What do you get? Is it 0.5? No. no. Okay, so what is it, roughly? 0.05. Yeah, 0 0.05, 0 0.1. Yeah, it's low, isn't it? Yeah. So, on average, no, across the span of the ages looked at, the influence of the foster parent, which of course is social, as far as there is one, as far as IQ goes, doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot. You know, now, if you're a sort of, you know, if you like straining at gnats and swallowing camels, and I don't know about whether it's statistical, you know, yeah, well, you know, um, if, the, if the left one is mothers, let's say for the sake of argument, there's a bit of a bump in the middle years, you know, eight. So you could argue perhaps the social impact of mothers is a bit bigger in the sort of, you know, as the kids in that sort of formative age of, you know, elementary school kind of thing, early middle school. But it's not a whole lot, right? Now, okay, so now let's look at the, the biological parent-child correlations. <coughs> Describe the two curves. Now, let's look at the left-hand figure for the sake of argument. Describe the two curves. The, let's assume for the sake of argument the actual, the non-dotted curve is the biological parent with their biological child reared by them, and the other one is the biological parent with the real child, biological child reared by somebody else. Okay? Describe those two curves. What do you see? Just describe them, you know, qualitatively. They're very similar. Okay, they're pretty similar. Right, yeah, okay. Are they on average higher or lower than when you've got the separated, you know, the children by their foster parents? Yeah, they're much higher, aren't they? So basically, the fact that they're biologically related is making them much more alike. So yeah, genes doing a lot in this in this study. Right. What else do you see about the shape of the curve? This is a Dr. Silberg question, really, because this is her kind of... Uh, they're the same. Well, they're the same, right. So there's no shape, there's this genetic rather than environmental. Mm -hmm. But look at the shape of the curve. When you go from when they're two, when they're really young, very low correlation. As they get older... Yeah, the, the correlation way. goes up as the children get older. Now, what's that telling you about the genetic control? Genes. Thank you. Development. Yeah. This is misdevelopmental genetics and behavior, sorry, but yeah. yeah. Right. The correlation is going up because when the kids are born, yes, they've got all the genes they need to be adults, but not actually, to put it crudely, turned on yet. So when you measure cognition in early kids, you're not measuring the genetics of adult cognitive function. It's only through a process of development that those genes that are there when the kid is born actually come to be expressed in cognitive function. That's pretty darn cool, actually. It's pretty darn cool. And I, and there's a bunch of us here who have kind of dined out for probably 20 years or more on how do you begin to build models for the developmental dynamics of genetic and environmental change. Uh, some of the, I think some of the most fun stuff we do here is like that. Okay, well, in the last five minutes now. So, we now have a whole pile of data. And we have some ideas about how the world might be. 
how do we put it together? And the answer to that question is most beautifully put in two tables and one figure. Table 5.9, which is from David's um, chapter. Do you have the table 22.1 in your... There's a big chapter. Yes, you do. Great. There's a table 22.1, which is an updated version of that, which um, um, my good friend in Colorado, who I shall see next week, um, Greg Carey put together, which is a more recent version of the same kind of thing. And what we have are two tables... One which goes back to the sort of um, late seventies, and one which is actually been updated by like um, probably twenty odd years by um, Greg Carey, which give the <coughs> a summarise all the data that has been available to that point for the genetics of IQ from different kinds of relationships. So what you've got, look at David's five point nine. You've got all the relationships that he could pluck out of the sky by looking at out of the literature. And here, the n's are not the sample size, but they are the number of studies. So what he's done is go comb the literature of every study he could find. I mean, he's got some help in his with, the, with the Kimi Earl and Mike Kimley, of an earlier paper, and said, OK, what is the weighted average correlation I get from all these studies, and how much do the studies vary? OK, so what you've got, for example, here is... Um, <coughs> 35 studies of siblings reared together. 12 studies of parents' offspring reared, and so on and so forth, okay? And these are the median correlations for each of those groups. So it takes all those correlations for the siblings and says, what's the median value? Okay, you know, it looks at the data, something to sort of come up with a number which summarizes all the different studies. And here, that's what that column is. When it says observed correlation O, that's what they are. That's what you actually find when you look at all the studies and put them all together. Right? And then he's got our model. VG and VEC. Mostly halves and ones and mostly ones and zeros. Right? A very simple, crude model. But then he does something really smart. Which, in fairness, um, he got because he was taught genetics in the right place. And that was really it's this approach which really was the key to that paper I mentioned yesterday by John Jinks and David Fulker, the model fitting approaches and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and he said, OK, I want to know if I take all those data, how many correlations there are, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 different correlations. So I've got 10 kind of data points. <clears throat> And I've got two numbers I'm interested in. What do those data, what values of those two numbers give me the best possible fit to those data? Bearing in mind that if there's no set of numbers that gives a good fit to the data, then the model's wrong. And the approach you used is one that underlies, we, 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 we got more, you know, we talk about maximum likelihood now and all that kind of stuff, and we do a bit more fancy models and all the rest of it. And we're talking about this, but the basic idea is what they did here. They said, okay, I am going to use, I'm going to, in effect, try all different possible combinations of values to a given degree of accuracy and see which one gives me the closest agreement between observed and expected. And what we see here is. The answer that he gets for, if I take the best possible values to which I do that, is, you know, I get, v, I get a VG of 0.69, a VCE of 0.18, and a VSE, that's the specific environment, the within, the within family environment, of 0.13. If I plug those values in, those give me the expectations. Which is what the model would predict if these were the numbers. And then he says, OK, I'm going to look at the difference between the observed and expected. That's the right hand. He's look at those numbers. OK, the agreement's very, very close, right? Now, he's done that in a way which says, OK, I'm also going to take into account that I've got much, I've got much bigger samples, many more studies for some numbers than others. 
So I'm going to choose, I'm going to allow the sample sizes of the studies to influence which, are going to, which studies are going to get the most kind of information. And so he uses the information about each study to weight their contribution to the estimate. So it's a method of weighted least squares. You are trying to find the pair of numbers that gives you the closest agreement between the observed and expected. Recognizing that you know negative differences and positive differences sort of you know really just telling you that you know they're just measures of difference. And so you square them out and up together. So, you know, if you want to know how good the model is overall, you take all those positive and small small positive and negative numbers and you square them. Now it turns out in practice you don't have to try all possible numbers because there is a calculus mathematical kind of way of solving that problem, which is just in one, in pretty much in one or two cycles, will give you the best answer without trying every possible number between one and zero for everything. And when you do that, you get these estimates at the bottom of the table, estimated effects, 0 0.69, 0 0.18, 0 0.13. But what's really cool, you also get estimates of how of the, of the, of the sampling error of these estimates. So if you take all the data known to the human race by the time David wrote this paper on IQ, you come up with an estimate of VG of 0.69 plus or minus 0.02. You come up with an estimate of VCE of 0.18 plus or minus 0.02 an estimate of VSE, which is just the difference by subtraction, of 0.13. Not exactly the same as we set out with yesterday morning at 9.15, but darn close. And now, based on a mass of data, and the other final call cool bit is, okay, <coughs> how much of the variation in these 10 correlations does this model predict? Now, how much is left to my further ingenuity? That's, you know, well, variation in the correlations, explained by the way, by the model, is 98%. So you kind of explained 98% of the differences between those correlations by in terms of these two very simple three, if you count VCE, but that's a bit of the, the um, specific part, that's just kind of what's left over. So, you know, a really a classic example of the, of the application of the being approach, coming up with some, a very simple initial explanation of a very complicated problem. Therein lies the beauty of science, ladies and gentlemen. Um, have a nice day. <laughs>